Hello, welcome back to the Brendan O'Neill Show with me, Brendan O'Neill, and my special guest this week, Paul Morland. Paul, welcome to the show. Hello. It's great to have you on, and I want to talk to you about your new book, which is called No One Left, Why the World Needs More Children. So you've got this kind of scary title, conjuring up a world in which there will be zero human beings, and then you've got this positive subtitle, why the world needs more children. You've written this in your capacity as an esteemed demographer, someone who's been observing population trends for some time. And the book is full of interesting information and observations and some really positive assessments of humanity and what we're capable of. So I really want to ask you about all of that stuff. But I first want to ask you about what inspired you to write this book at this moment. You open the book with two lines, which I think are are really good. You say, Making the case for having children has never been more urgent. Making the case for having children has never been more difficult. And I thought that was a really good summary of where we're at. So explain to us why you thought it was necessary to write this pro-natalist book at this time. Well, thank you very much for having me. Um, This is actually my fourth book. And I will very briefly tell you about the other three because they kind of lead up to this moment in a sense. Um, I had always planned to do a doctoral thesis at some point in my life and thought I'd do it when I retired. And then when my third child went to secondary school, although I was working as a business consultant, um, I suddenly found I had a bit more time in my life. Uh, You know, you get a family, you get very busy in your career. And then when you're not having to mind them quite to the same extent, you find you've got a little bit of time. So I thought I would do a thesis and I thought up what I might do it about. Demography has been of interest to me for a long time. Two things really triggered it. One, I think being born and brought up in Wembley, one of the first parts of London to experience very rapid demographic and ethnic change, which I observed growing up in the 60s and 70s and 80s. And secondly, observing the fertility choices of our friends and relations when we got married in the early 90s, some of them never having children, some of them having six or seven, and thinking through why that was, what the patterns were, And I suppose that sort of triggered my interest in demography. I was looking to do a a thesis on the subject of ethnic conflict and demography, specifically how do groups in ethnic conflict use demography as part of their strategy. And so I was looking for someone who might be the right kind of uh, academic to supervise me. And I stumbled on this chap called Eric Kaufman. And it turned out that Eric himself did his PhD under a great friend of mine, Anthony Smith, who was a theorist of nationalism. So I approached Eric, who, of course, I'd never met, and we did the thesis. It was great. I mean, he's brilliant in so many ways and was an excellent PhD supervisor. I should say he's some years younger than me, not that many, but a few. Um, I got that done part time quite quickly. And then someone said to me, get it published, uh, which was actually relatively easy. I found a publisher who was interested in it, and that worked out well. It was published as an academic book. Academic publishing is a world of its own, if you like. Uh, books are, are priced for academic libraries. It was, I don't know, 70 quid or something. It, it was quite well received. It got several reprints, um, and it was reviewed in academic journals. And that, I thought, was that. But then it occurred to me, well, I should write a book about the history of the world from a demographic perspective. Once we got out of the Malthusian trap and things started getting dynamic and interesting in the late 18th, early 19th century, start it then and show how demography changed and that drove the success of the British Empire, the growth of America, and then how that change went around the world and drove world history. So that was The Human Tide, which was published in 2019. And I think it was the first book of its kind, really, since a book I found in the London Library buried away somewhere, published in 1947, called L'Histoire de la Population Mondiale, The History of World Population. So that was a kind of model, although being a French book, of course, it's the history of global demography, and about two-thirds of it is, is about French demography. Such are our cousins across the channel. So then I thought, well, that, that was great, but what about a book that sort of, instead of showing this process happening over time, looks at where we are now? Where are populations growing? Where are they shrinking? Where are they moving? What's the interlink between these things? And that inspired me to write Tomorrow's People, which came out two years ago. And so far, so good. And they were all fairly, even though the last two were kind of popular or aimed at a general audience, they were books for the general public, but they were, um, I suppose you could say, scientific in the sense I wasn't really... um, 
standing on a pulpit or taking a particular view. I think there's one short section of um, the human type where I say a point of view, and I make some generally pronatalist comments in there, um, saying sort of extremely controversial things like human life's quite a good thing. Um, that was the point where I was introduced to someone who was trying to get a bill through the House of Lords to set up a population agency a bit like the Office for a Budgetary Responsibility. So saying we should start thinking about demography nationally, that never happened, that House of Lords bill didn't get through. But it started me thinking about the question of, do we need more people, do we need fewer, in a bit more detail. And then I wrote an article for the Sunday Times, in which I said there were a lot of reasons why we should be worried about our low fertility in the UK, 50 years of having too few children to replace ourselves, and the government should start doing something about it. And I suggest a whole range of things, including that we might do what a lot of foreign countries do, France, Hungary, Cuba, countries of the left, countries of the right, countries of the centre, which is have a policy about encouraging more births in countries which have low fertility rates. So I wrote this article, which the Sunday Times, bless them, decided to entitle, Is It Time to Tax the Childless? Which I thought, it wasn't my title, but I had no problem with it, and it got it some publicity. And it was basically saying, we need to give tax cuts to people who have kids, but I don't want to be the 99th person in line to the Chancellor saying, here's my particular hobby horse, it needs more money, otherwise we're going to hell in the handcart. So maybe we should vary tax rates and have a slightly higher band, whatever the right level is, from a fiscal or economic point of view, we should maybe vary bands a bit so that people get tax credits if they have children. And that gave rise to quite a lot of controversy. And so I thought this needs to be developed into a book, which explains more thoroughly what the problem is, why it is a problem, and where it's coming from and where it's going globally. It's very much like my other three books, very much a global book. Um, and then talks about the kind of objections that you might throw at it. What about feminism? Well, what can't we solve it all through immigration? Isn't technology going to fix it all? Um, what about the environment? And then talk a little bit about what we might do about it. Now, the what we might do about it is very important, but I think before we get there in real detail, we as a community, as a society, as a human race, need to recognise it's a problem. So I don't go into that in too much detail. And the reason I think it's timely, it's timely and urgent because this low fertility tendency was at one point a preserve of wealthy countries. In fact, it goes beyond that. If you go to Edwardian England, the upper middle classes were starting to use contraception and have small families. Working classes at that point didn't have them. And I remember when I was a kid, I had a babysitter, a lovely woman from a working class family, probably Edwardian, and she said how her six and seven brothers and sisters used to sleep in a bed sort of lengthways. And that was a working class family in the pre-First World War era. My family in the pre-First World War era, which was all in Germany and all middle class, they all my grandparents were twos and threes. So what was happening at that point, it was working down the social stratum, if you like, within the Western world. And then that started to happen globally. So again, a little anecdote, Singapore, 1960s, very worried about too many kids, very high birth rate, six or seven, infant mortality falling, buoyant population, very small territory. By the 80s, when my Singaporean friends who I met at university went back to Singapore, it was the eugenics moment, like in Britain in the Edwardian period. The right sort of people, those clever Oxbridge kids who were coming back, weren't getting married. And the poorer, less educated Singaporeans were having many kids. And that was the moment that Lee Kuan Yew was at his most eugenicist, if you like. And he used to send my friend and her mates out on love cruises and so on, so that they would meet partners and the right sort of genes would carry on. I think that eugenic thing is a moment in history, if you like, when certain classes are using contraception and certain classes are now in Singapore. They're desperately trying to get people to have more kids because it's gone all the way down society and it's a social phenomenon. So just as it's within societies globally, there was a time that this was, if you like, a white man's problem or a white woman's problem. And so if you talked about it, you were accused of being racist. It's not that at all. It's a human problem. We see the lowest fertility rates in East Asia and China, Japan, Korea. In Korea, they have 
a third, two thirds of a child for each two people. So 100 grandparents roughly make 33 children, roughly make a dozen grandchildren. That's the sort of speed of population decline you're going to see there. It's even happening in quite poor countries. Jamaica and Thailand, to take two random examples, have significantly lower fertility rates than the UK. In the early 70s, when mass migration from Mexico began to the US, Mexican women were having like six or seven kids. And American women were having, at that point, they were going, that was the end of the baby boom, they were going down towards two. Today, Mexican women have only slightly higher fertility rates than American women. And Indian women have fertility rates not much higher than Britain. In many parts of India, it's lower. So the idea that it's a rich white thing is false. It's a human thing, and we may get on to talk about why it's a human thing. Uh, that itself is fascinating and important. Um, and so if this is going global, if this is getting wider and wider, the luxury of thinking we don't need to have our own kids, we can ship them in from Ireland. That was one of our traditional uh, sources of immigration. Poland, you know, nice, easy, nearby countries with similar cultures. People would assimilate in a generation or two, um, quickly pick up the language, and they'd keep on pumping out kids and sending them to us because they're poor and have lots of kids. Well, you know, neither Poland nor Ireland in that situation anymore. So more and more of the world is going to be having fewer and fewer children, less and less of the world will continue to have high fertility. So that's not the solution. So I thought it was time to, lots of people are talking about this. I mean, I've been talking about it. You see articles, you see conferences, you see organizations. Um, very interesting people like Malcolm and Simone Collins in the States, you may have come across. I think both The Guardian and The Telegraph have profiled them. I've met them a couple of times. Very interesting people. All sorts of people are starting to talk about this. But I thought there was room for and time for a book, which actually, as I said, systematically looks at what's happening, why is it happening, where is it happening, what's the basic dynamic if you think it's a problem, what sort of answers are you going to get from people? How do we repost them? And then what might we do about it? So in a rather roundabout way, I hope I've answered your question. If you're a regular listener to this show or a regular reader of Spiked, why not become a Spiked supporter? Spiked Supporters is our thriving community of people who donate to Spiked. Anyone who gives £5 or more a month or £50 or more a year can become a Spiked supporter and get access to lots of exciting perks. Spiked supporters can comment on articles, get free and discounted tickets to events, get a discount on all items in our shop and bookmark articles as you browse. This is our way of saying thank you to all of you who fund our work. Spiked is completely free and yet you still hand over your hard-earned cash to make sure that anyone, anywhere can read us and listen to us. We're incredibly grateful for your generosity. If you don't give to Spiked yet, now is the perfect time to start. Just go to spiked-online.com slash supporters to set up your donation and your Spike supporters account. That's spiked-online.com slash supporters. You have answered it, absolutely. And you've also set up the other questions I want to ask you very nicely there. One of the things that drew me um, to this book is I remember your Sunday Times piece about Brits needing to have more kids and ways in which they might be encouraged to do so. And I remember the fallout from it. I remember The Guardian published a piece essentially accusing you in a way of being a eugenicist. And as you've just said there, there is always that risk that people who make a pro-natalist argument will be accused, even in the absence of anything resembling evidence, of wanting certain people to have kids and other people not to have kids. And your book is clearly not about that. So, okay, let's talk a little bit then about what is happening. And uh, let's take maybe Britain, or if you prefer, another part of Europe, as an illustration of what's happening. You've already mentioned it's happening in East Asia, it's happening in America. This is a global problem, as you say. Chapter one of your book opens, I always like a book that borrows from the Communist Manifesto, and your <laughs> chapter one opens with a spectre is haunting Europe, and you say it's also haunting East Asia and much of North America, and that is the spectre of dwindling fertility. You have this great line where you say, we are seeing the birth pangs of a new epoch, 
but it's an epoch without birth pangs. That did make me chuckle. Tell us a bit about the what. What is happening in a country like Britain, for example? What exactly is happening to the fertility rates? In Britain, we had traditionally high fertility like the rest of the world. Most people living in marital conditions um, throughout most of their fertile years, regular sexual congress, one assumes, and an average of five or six or even seven children per woman. That was the state just about everywhere. And that's the state that Malthus kind of uh, explained. And it started to change in the uh, early 19th century. And what later on we called the demographic transition, which I think is the big idea of, I suppose Malthus is the big idea, and the demographic transition is the second big idea. Malthus's big idea is we triple and triple and triple every generation. We can't do that. We'll run up against the ability of the world to support us, starting with a quarter of a billion in the time of Julius Caesar. We'd have had thousands of billions by the year 500. Never going to happen. Why not? Because we bump up against these limits and people die in misery. And a third of kids would die or a quarter before the age of one. Most people wouldn't make it through their fertile years. And in good times, good harvest population goes up and it gets not that very slow rise in the ability of the world to support people and this huge pressure of people against that limit. And by the way, reading Malthus was the moment that Charles Darwin said the penny dropped because he realised that's happening to all species, the fig tree with thousands of figs, with thousands of, of seeds. But coming back to Malthus, so just as Malthus wrote that, the world was changing. What was changing was the Industrial Revolution, an extraordinary opening of the world to new sources of food. The prairies could be settled and food could be sent by railway and steamship to Europe and areas that had supported small numbers of hunter-gatherers or primitive agriculturists could support millions. And so what happened in Britain first, and it spread throughout Europe and then the rest of the world, was we still had high fertility until the 1860s or 1870s. People were still having six or seven kids. But the mortality rate fell. And that meant the same number of high arrivals, fewer departures, massive population growth. Britain's population are more than tripled, almost quadrupled in the 19th century, and also fed this massive emigration to California, to Australia and so on. So that was the expansive phase. And then by the time of the First World War, as I was saying, middle class people in Britain, in Germany and elsewhere were starting to have smaller families and that spread across uh, the whole of society. So you go from a high fertility, high mortality, small population, and eventually you get to a a low fertility, low mortality, high population. Population's grown, and then it stabilizes, and everyone has a couple of kids, and this to somewhere between 75 and 85, and that's the end of demographic history, if you like. That's what I learned when I was at school in the 70s. Um, and places do this at different phases. So Africa uh, uh, today is still in that phase of parts of Africa. Some parts are getting their fertility rates down, but other parts, they're still having very large families, but the infant mortality is collapsing, the life expectancy is growing, the population is growing. People go through these phases. And what's happened, though, since the 70s is that in large parts of the world, first of all, very developed countries, but other countries that they've got developed, and even now undeveloped countries, quite poor countries, people are choosing to have not the couple of kids, but far less than that. Quite a lot of countries are knocking around one. I mean, China, Japan, uh, Korea, as we know, has gone below one. So one means every cohort half the size of the last one. And it's kind of overshoot, if you like. We've gone through this process and we think we've got to the end of history. Or I say, I think it was in, in Tomorrow's People I talk about, I think it's Fukuyama who talks about getting to Denmark. And he means liberal social democracy. I mean low mortality and low fertility. So a couple of kids and everybody living 75, 85. But lots of countries are overshooting that more and more. And for, I think, cultural rather than economic reasons, they're having very, and we'll perhaps talk a little bit about this culture versus economic, they're having very small families. And what that means is, first of all, Take Britain, for example. I mean, I've just written an, an article for Policy Exchange with my friend, the economist Philip Pilkington, which I hope will be published in the next few months. And what that argues is that the Thatcher economic success was in part built on what we call the demographic dividend. So what happens in a society, it was a kind of late demographic dividend for Britain. When you had lots of kids, and they then don't have that many, you've got lots of 20, 30-somethings in the workplace, and they're not ducking out of the workplace and having their own kids. So you've got lots and lots of people of working age. And because you've had that 
demographic growth, you don't have many retirees to support. And I argue that actually the 80s, with the post-war baby boomers like me, fully coming through, I was born in 64, that was the peak up at the end of the baby boom. We were all coming through to the workforce. There was an unemployment problem, but there was plentiful labour. We didn't have much immigration. And the economy eventually, once it got through its troubles in the early 80s, did extremely well. And I, I think that was a moment of a double advantage in a way, because we, we were storing up problems for ourselves by not having enough kids. But what that meant is a very high percentage of people of working age, not that many retirees because the population had grown, not that much investment required in schools. And stuff. If you've got that and you're then not, as it were, investing in the seed corn, you're not having enough children. Eventually, the baby boomers retire. I'm going to be 60 later this year, and I'm a very, very young baby boomer by about six weeks, if you count 64 as the baby boom someday, some say 63. So we're all now leaving the workplace and we haven't replaced ourselves. So what does that mean? That means that the so-called old age dependency ratio, the number of retirees to workers gets higher and higher, dramatically higher. I mean, just to give you one piece of data, when Japan reached 100 million people in the 60s, there were, I think, seven or eight working age people for every retiree. And now it's going down. When it hits 100 million again in the 2040s, I think, 2050s, there'll be roughly one for one. People say, well, it was fine at 100 million. It will be fine when it's back at 100 million. It's very different when you've got six, seven, eight workers, people of working age, to every retiree, to one to one in terms of taxes, in terms of care. So the shortage of labor expresses itself in many ways. For example, the huge demand for very labour-intensive work looking after older people, lack of labour. I mean, if you talk to government ministers or SPADs, as I have, everyone's saying the business community is crying out for more workers. In Britain, we've got very stagnant economy, mass immigration. We still don't have enough workers. So that's because when I joined the workforce, there were many, many more 20-somethings coming in than 60-somethings going out, and now the two almost balance each other out. So you get to this point of ageing, You can move the retirement age, but that's pretty minor its effects. And by the way, Putin tried it and had to retreat on that front. Macron tried it, and we see what's happened to him. Its beneficial effects are limited, and it's very, very hard politically. And so you get to a point where you have more and more old people. Another way it expresses itself is government debt. So the government um, has to borrow a lot of money. Uh, It hasn't got enough of a tax base. It's promises in terms of pensions, in terms of health care and so on. And everything gets difficult. And eventually, I think the thing will go pop. And Japan will probably be a good example of this. Japan's an advanced case. It's had below replacement fertility for as long as we have, but it's been much lower for a long time. And that's what I'm really warning against. And the next stage after the population ages is you start seeing population decline, more deaths and births every year. Now, in Britain, we are still more births than deaths but by the thinnest of margins. In Germany, and the EU as a whole, actually, take the whole of the EU, there are about half as many deaths every year, again, as there are births. So there's a huge population decline going on. And the only thing that saves those countries is immigration from population decline. And then you have countries like China, Bulgaria, where you are going to have mass immigration for economic reasons or cultural, social reasons, And you've gone through this long aging process and the populations are declining quite rapidly. And I think we can only begin to start thinking about what the world looks like when a country's population halves and halves and halves again. Right. That answers a lot of the next question I have for you as well, which is not only the what is happening, but what impact will it have? And you've touched on a lot of that there and you touch on it a great deal in the book, of course. And you explain very well in the book about I'm sure it will strike listeners as entirely logical that if you have an aging population because we have developed the medical and technological means to keep people alive for longer which is wonderful but at the same time you have a declining population rate population growth then there is going to be a mismatch at some point between the section of the population that needs care and the replenishment of the population that might provide that care economically and socially and and everything else it's a very convincing argument that you make One thing I wanted to ask you, I guess, in relation to the question of the impact of these demographic shifts, explain to us how bad you think it will get. Do you think it's possible there's an element 
of hyperbole in your book because you do talk about the looming demographic Armageddon. Now, Armageddon is a very scary word, of course, and you talk uh, in great detail about the impact and just how colossal the impact would be. I mean, we're talking civilizational decay levels of impact. That's the impression that we get from reading your book. Is there a risk that this is a kind of flip side of the Malthusian? Malthusians will often talk about Armageddon and the destruction of the planet by us marauding human beings and and our over-fertility as they see it because they're not keeping abreast of what's going on in the world. Is there a danger that we play our demographic card against their demographic card and what you have are two competing visions of what will bring about the end of civilization whether it's having too many children or not having enough children do you think there's a risk with that well i'm not really given to hyperbole i mean anyone who knows me would say i'm a fairly sort of level-headed uh, kind of person i think Elon Musk has talked about humanity collapsing the prime minister of japan has talked about civilizational collapse uh, and of course, you're absolutely right. We need to be careful to choose our words and not to panic. And I sort of restructured my book at various points, and my publisher had various views. But at one point, I had a chapter which ended up being distributed elsewhere called Can't We Just Muddle Through? And that was a kind of voice at the back of my head saying exactly what you've said, which is surely this is another moral panic. Surely there must be a response. There's a way we'll figure it out. Well, the most obvious way we might figure it out, and they've got a chapter on that in the book, is technology, that technology will replace labor. And I think um, the best way I would repost that is to say this time is different again. So I talk a bit about the Luddites. And if you'd said to someone in 1800, by 1900, a very small share of the population will be working in agriculture they would have said, well, we, we won't have any jobs. I and mean, what else would people do? That was the only world they could imagine. If in 1900 you'd said, by 2000, very small numbers of people will be working in industry, they'd say, well, they're not working in industry, they're not working in agriculture, what on earth could they do? We're always inventing new needs for labor. Um, I think in the book, I give the example of one of my sons-in-law, his entry on LinkedIn. It's something about automated testing that I don't really understand. But, you know, I can quote that and say my parents didn't really understand what I did. So the world is always developing and evolving. We need labor. What's interesting in an advanced country like Britain is that we don't have a huge amount of agriculture or industry. The robots, which have most easily replaced those sorts of jobs, are not going to replace a lot of labor. Everything from bin men to brain surgeons to people caring for old people I can't see how technology is going to make that much difference in the foreseeable future. And there are experts in AI who say what AI can do and can't do, who agree with me, or at least support my view, that AI can do so much. But it's another case of, oh, laptops, computers, the internet, whatever, this is all going to end labor. And here we are um, in 2024 with labor shortages. Another way to think of it is productivity gains. If we were on the verge of not needing labor, we would either end up with half the population creating our current economy or we'd have twice the economy with the same workforce. Either way, we'd see productivity gain, the simple economic measure of how much value is created per hour of work. The more hype we get on robots, computers, AI going to take all the work out, which would mean much higher productivity levels, the sicker the productivity growth gets. And there's a really interesting debate among economists, which I'm not qualified to participate in, about why that might be. But I can't see us not needing labor. And if we have societies that are getting older and older and older, where fewer and fewer people as a percentage of the population are working, then I can't see a way out of this. One way would be technology. I'm dubious. One way would be immigration. But as I've said, we can't all be importing immigrants from a diminishing pool, and there are other disadvantages to immigration. There's the fact that as more and more of the world enters this low fertility area, um, the countries with high fertility are poorer and poorer, less and less productive. So if we need to import people from high fertility countries, these will increasingly be people with very low education levels, very low productivity, so they won't really help our economies. It's a whole raft of arguments about should we be taking the best and brightest from countries like Ghana when we have so much more medical 
staff per head of the population and then we're importing them when they don't have them at home. Should we be saying we're important, um, we're busy, you have the kids and we'll we'll ship them in as we need them. Thank you very much. So a whole set of reasons why I don't think immigration is the full answer, why I don't think technology is the full answer. So I can't see a way out of this except by this extraordinary, crazy notion that people might average two to three children like they did in the 1960s. That doesn't seem to me like it should be impossible. So I don't want to be alarmist, but I don't think we've ever seen anything like this before. In the Black Death, we saw the population fall enormously. Some would say in Europe as a whole by about a third. It took out the whole population pyramid. We haven't seen these inverted population pyramids before. We haven't seen societies voluntarily cutting the size of each cohort by two thirds. So I think it is alarming. And whilst I'm not uh, given to hyperbole, I do think it's worth spelling it out. Partly, if other people can come up and tell me why I'm wrong and why we should all be comforted by this, I'm happy to have the debate and I'm happy to have got the debate going. Um, But if we can't, then surely it's time to sound the alarm and say we need to do something about it. So instead of people in this country having 1.6, 1.7 children per couple, we might put it up to 2.5. I think it's worth having that conversation. And occasionally one needs to be a little bit dramatic in order to get the conversation going. I'm always happy to quote Marx. In fact, one of the points I make, if I may have a little sort of divergence on this for a moment, is when I wrote that article, I was called all sorts of things. And I had a conversation with Jonathan Sachs, the late chief rabbi on this. And I said that that he pointed out to me that the first commandment in the Bible is to be fruitful and multiply. So here I am sort of... uh, repeating the basis of the Judeo-Christian morality and being accused of being a Nazi, practically. Um, But there is a long tradition of pronatalism on the left. Marx was very critical of Malthus. I think Marx's writings on Malthus are quite brilliant. Um, The Soviet Union went through a very long pronatal phase, all the way from Stalin to Brezhnev. Women were getting medals. Other left-wing regimes, Castro's regime. I mean, the trouble with the left, is they never quite like the real... So if I say, well, Stalin did it, well, that's no argument. Mao did it, well, that's not... Castro did it, well, maybe that's an argument. But anyway, many of the heroes of the left, um, who may no longer be heroes, have been very pronatal, from Marx to Mao. It's interesting that the one-child policy only got going after Mao's death and after the defeat of the Gang of Four. Not that I'm saying I'm a Stalinist or a Maoist or a Castroist, God forbid, or a Marxist, heaven for them. But I am saying there's a rich and interesting and informed and lively and intelligent pronatalism of the left. And I think people on the left should be fighting this battle and not allowing the current wokery, if that's what it is, if it's wokery or wokeness, to colonise the left in its attitudes to this particular subject. Yeah, that's very well put. And um, I think it was Marx who referred to Malthus's writings on population as a libel on the human race in terms of, you know, this depiction of breeding mankind as the sealer of his own desperate fate. And Marx made the point that um, it's the poverty of the social imagination, not what people get up to under the sheets that is the real contributor to whether society advances or, or not. And he thought that Malthus was saying poverty is a given, it's natural, it's built into the system of reality rather than built into a particular social structure. Now, I mean, I think for various reasons, before the Industrial Revolution, Malthus had a point. Um, but Marx also had a point. But anyway, the point was that the Marxian critique of Malthusianism is, is very pertinent and one of the most powerful. Proudhon also, a partly forgotten writer of the left, the 19th century, uh, very unpleasant like Marx was in many ways, but also very critical of Malthus. So there's a good, long and interesting tradition of leftist pronatalism, which I think if we're going to crack this one, um, someone on the left needs to rediscover it. Yeah. The way in which what passes for the left today has moulded itself around essentially Malthusian ideologies, especially in relation to climate change alarmism and certain aspects of the environmentalist movement, which are very Malthusian in their attitudes towards population and the question of production and resources and so on. They have an entirely Malthusian imagination. So the left's abandonment of 
what we might refer to as more positive, original Marxist thinking in favour for the depressing creed of Malthusian ideology, I think is really worrying. I agree with what you've just said, by the way, on labour, the necessity of labour, and not being able to see a world in which labour can just be done away with. And I do think some of the kind of, even though I'm very, very pro-technology, I do think some of the technophiles, when they argue that technology will fix everything and AI will fix everything and the rest of us can smoke pot and get universal basic income, uh, that's their kind of depressing vision for the future. It's just entirely unrealistic. There is so much of human life and human production that requires human beings. And that goes for everything from tending to le- to the elderly, to teaching school children and certain forms of production. All of it is going to necessitate human labour. I also agree with you about the immigration question not being a solution to demographic problems. And in fact, that's where the left can sound almost borderline eugenicist, because you can envision a situation where they essentially say, well, let's encourage population growth overseas, because then that will give us a greater source of labour for the jobs that we no longer do because we're not having kids and we can't be bothered. So you can see a kind of eugenicism creeping into treating other countries as just a source of people who can do the stuff we don't want to do, which I think it could easily uh, cross the line into something quite racist and scary. There's one other point I want to make, if I may, which is the book focuses a lot on economics and on numbers and on labour force and on support ratios. It's difficult because these are things that are very much out there. They're in the in the realm of public discourse. But I'm not just saying it for that reason. I think there's a deeply human reason. I think human life is wonderful. And as a parent, I think having had three kids myself, I've got two grandchildren with another one on the way. And I think it's just the most wonderful thing. But I'm more of a demographer than a poet. So if I were poetic, I would write about the joys of parenthood. And how sad it is the more and more people are depriving themselves of those joys. I don't want that to be lost sight of. I think it's difficult to talk about and it's difficult to quantify. And I think it gets purged from writing because that's not what demographers write about. I would say, however briefly, we shouldn't lose sight of that. That human life is a miraculous and wonderful thing. And that parenthood and grandparenthood are the most life enhancing things, certainly that I have experienced. Well, it's interesting you say that because that's what I was about to come on to. And I'm not going to ask you to turn into a poet and start waxing lyrical about all of these things. But I did want to ask you about the questions that lie slightly beyond the economic arguments, as important as they are, and even beyond the demographic arguments in the narrow sense of numbers here, numbers there. Is it balancing the books or not? Uh, I'm not saying that's what your book does. Your book is much broader than that. But the questions that exist beyond those planes, and I guess ex- which exist in, I guess in the plane of morality, what is morally good? What is morally worthwhile? What is morally virtuous? If one is even allowed to ask questions like that these days, and that brings me on to something you've already mentioned, which is the cultural reasons for why people um, in some countries are having fewer kids than they did in the past, and it's such an interesting thing that you said there, and also it's an interesting theme in your book. I mean, if you look at a country like Britain, or certainly North America and other countries in Europe, and South Korea, and countries that are well off, it's clearly not the case, even though there are still poor people, it's clearly not the case that people are not having kids because they can't afford it. There's something else going on. And you will often hear people argue, you'll often hear Guardian columnists say, well, if wages were higher and houses were easier to buy, people might be having more kids. I find that so unconvincing. My parents had six children when they were not very well housed and certainly did not have much money, but there was still a drive to have children, to procreate, to give birth to new life. So something else is going on beyond economics. Talk to us a little bit about what you think some of those cultural reasons might be for the decline in fertility? Well, I don't want to be dismissive entirely of economic reasons. And I always say, of course, we must work harder to make sure our young uh, families can be housed. I think that's a huge issue. And, you know, I'm part of that lucky generation. My kids have had to struggle in the housing market, and I'm very aware of that. Childcare costs are very high. And I think we should do a lot about that. But as I always say, Where housing is cheap, parts of Britain, um, much of Germany, across lots of Southeast Europe, the Balkans, fertility rates are very low. 
where if you actually look at countries with highly subsidized childcare, like Germany, parts of the Baltics, fertility rates are low. So I'm very open to the Guardianista's view we should do more in these things to help people. That's wonderful. And wouldn't it be nice if funds were unlimited and etc.? But I certainly think on the housing front, we could do a lot more. And it's about planning and so on. But I don't think that will solve the problem. And there's a basic paradox, historical and geographical paradox. The historical paradox is that as societies get richer, their fertility rates go down. As people get richer, they find it harder and harder to afford children. The geographical perspective is the poorer countries still have larger families. So the highest fertility rates are in the poorest countries in Africa, in some Asian countries that are poor. So you come through that point where people are rich enough to have aspirations, to have women's education, to have access to contraception. And fertility rates inevitably come down from six to something. And then the question is, do they come down from six to two thirds, like in South Korea, or do they come down from six to three, like in Israel, or six to three, like in Britain in the early 60s? And that, I think, is cultural. And the question then is, what are the cultural correlates of very low fertility and high fertility? And they're quite complicated. There's no very easy answer. Whenever you think you've got a glib answer, you can find a counterexample. It certainly seems like the worst fertility rates are in highly educated, wealthy, patriarchal countries. So if you give women education and then you don't allow them to have equality in the workplace and combine children with working, if that's what they want to do, then they won't have kids. And that's Korea. That's Greece, for example. The higher fertility rates in the developed world tend to be countries that have a more or less progressive attitude to women's rights. And as I always say, I'm the father of two daughters and a son, all got fantastic educations, all pursuing careers. My daughters have both had kids before they're 30, which isn't that early, but for highly educated women, uh, it's reasonably early. And I think that's the kind of attitude and that's the kind of approach, the kind of set of priorities that, if it were more common, would help. So I think it's a lot to do with priorities, it's a lot to do with personal preferences. There is a religious element that more religious people have larger families, and there's good evidence of that in the States, in Israel, even in Britain, in France, in Spain, whether you're measuring attendance or self-identification or whatever it is. So some kind of belief in a transcendent purpose and something that goes on beyond you. There is, as it happens, a left-right split in terms of politics and fertility in where it's been tested, certainly in the United States. The more Trumpian people have bigger families, um, the more Biden-esque uh, the smaller ones. In the States, that's definitely the case. I don't know if it's true in Britain. I haven't really seen evidence. I think country at the size of the state, you get such different cultures and such different uh, attitudes to family size and family in such different parts of the country. So there's a whole range of attitudes that go with Fertility, it was the case, coming back to that eugenicist moment, that more educated women had smaller families. And a lot of what's happened in the last 10, 15 years in the West, where fertility rates have gone down, is that less educated women have caught up at, with the very low fertility. What's encouraging is that the very most educated women in the States, the PhDs, have a slightly higher fertility rate. It's not a completely uh, linear uh, correlation. Um, so it sounds like I'm kind of coming on to solutioning. I suppose what I'm trying to say is the Guardian attitude about issues about housing, about childcare, they'll always be there. We could do much better on them. They will not, however, and we should do. They won't fix the issue. It's got to be about people's priorities. And people like your parents, I don't know about your, your background, but who maybe had difficult financial circumstances, uh, but nevertheless, Having children was a normal, natural thing that they aspired to. I don't know whether they didn't believe in using contraception or they just let love children. Whatever it was, um, that's what was the priority for their generation. And the question is, can we remoralize society in a way that that's what people want again as a high priority? And then they order their lives around it. They don't. They they change their expectations of their lifestyle, and they order their lives around. That's what we need to do. That's what we want to do. How do we fit our careers, our education, anything else around that? Now, that's what I think will crack the problem. It's very difficult to get there. It's down to people. It's not for me to preach. Um, I'm not going to wag my finger. 
But ultimately, if as societies we don't get there, then we will be dying out. And another thing I would say, if I may, is that one of the attitudes on immigration is people are fungible. They're all the same. If they're not having kids in Korea, they can ship them in from Burundi. It shouldn't matter to them. It's not for us good, white, cosmopolitan Europeans to go around the world to Koreans or Jamaicans or Indians and say, your culture's of no value. It's got nothing special about it. People elsewhere are having children. You should import them from there. Even if there wasn't a declining balance of the high and low fertility countries, um, there are such things as nations. There are such things as ethnic groups. There are such things as cultures. And if people actually care about their cultures and their traditions persisting over time and think that part of that should be their group, ethnic or national, reproducing itself and not relying on others to do so, I don't think that's horrendous and puts you at some extreme right-wing end of the spectrum. It's what might have been common sense and pretty much everybody would have thought in the mid-1970s, I guess. Hi, it's Brendan here. I just wanted to remind you that you can still buy my book. It's called A Heretic's Manifesto, Essays on the Unsayable, and I've really been blown away by the response to it from readers, reviewers, Spike supporters. People really like this book, and I think you're going to like it too. It covers all the insanities of our time, from climate change hysteria through to COVID authoritarianism, through to the trans ideology. And it basically makes the case for more freedom of speech, more debate, and more heretical thinking to challenge the conformism of our times. So what are you waiting for? Go to Amazon right now and order my book, A Heretic's Manifesto, Essays on the Unsayable. And now on with the show. It's interesting to hear you say that because one of the things I th always think about in relation to the declining fertility discussion is that there does seem to have been a breaking of the link between the individual and the civilization in which he lives or the civilization that he is a part of and or she and what i mean by that is that in the past there would have been a recognition at some level it might have been at the family level or community level or a religious level or a national level that you were part of something bigger than yourself and therefore if you chose to have children you were not only having children you were also contributing to the longevity of the civilization that you lived in or the nation that you lived in or the community that you were a part of there was a sense that having a family was important in and of itself and very rewarding in and of itself but it also played a bigger role for something beyond oneself and that seems to have broken down uh, quite significantly. And one of the things I wanted to ask you about in relation to the cultural reasons that there might be this turn against natalism is in relation to the element of fear that seems to inform some people's decisions. I think you're right that, of course, economic questions play a role. I don't think they are the decisive factor. I think you're right about that, but they do play a role. Cultural reasons play a role, but there's also this very fearful attitude amongst the new generation in particular, particularly around issues to do with climate change, the future of humankind, the planet's going to be burnt to a cinder in the next 50 years, so why bother? You write in the book about the birth strike movement, which is a, a small movement of eco-aware people who say, look, we're not going to have kids because they'll just be polluters and it will destroy the planet even faster than we're already doing. You write about some of the young women who are climate change alarmists, I would say, who are even opting for being made infertile at a young age, being sterilized in order that they can never have children. Now, these are pretty extreme examples, but you do make the point in the book, which I found very convincing, that nonetheless, the climate change panic, so this goes beyond the question of climate change as a practical challenge and becomes this kind of world-ending phenomenon that we're all supposed to be scared of. You make the point that the climate change panic unquestionably has a trickle-down impact on people's sense of priorities, sense of decision-making, sense of their ability to contribute to a future that might go beyond their own life cycle. So say a little bit about the role you think those kinds of cultural phenomena play when it comes to people's decisions whether or not to have kids. Well, I've been very much influenced by Julian Simon. I don't know if you know him as a writer, but he's sort of, in effect, the godfather who's behind people like Matt Ridley or Bjorn Lomborg 
Um, and I mean, and they themselves are great writers who who influenced me. And I always say that that if we are, if the world today is too bad to have children, when infant mortality rates are a fraction of what they were even when I was born, when the number of people in extreme poverty has fallen dramatically even since the year 2000, um, when more and more people have got enough food and good drinking water, as conditions get better and better, if it's too bad now to have children, our parents, when they're, if they're still alive, should be locked up for their criminality for having us. And as for our grandparents, when infant mortality, when my oldest grandfather, who I never knew, was born in the 1880s. So when he was born in Germany in the 80s, I imagine the infant mortality in Germany is probably about 150 per thousand. So 15% of kids died before they were one, and at least a third wouldn't have made it to adolescence. So what on earth were his parents thinking of? And my youngest grandparent, two years before the First World War broke out, with all the clouds over Europe. I mean, hadn't her parents listened to Marla? Didn't they know the world was going to collapse? So we actually have it incredibly good. That doesn't mean I'm being complacent, and I think we should think about the environment, and we should hopefully have lots of young people doing brilliant things in science. If we crack the environmental problems, it will be from an inventive, educated, buoyant, young population, not from a growing old age home like Japan, and you can actually correlate, that's not just rhetoric, you can see how old aging societies get less inventive. So all the brilliant ideas that will allow us to use the planet more sensibly and more prudently will come from young people. So my hope is that somewhere this message gets through, that as things get better and better, not perfect, they aren't perfect, they never will be, but as they get better and better, as humanity sorts out so many problems for itself, we in Britain have emissions per capita back to 19th century levels. I mean, we've made so much progress in so many ways. Hundreds of millions of people have been taken out of poverty in China. There's so much good news. If all you can do as there's less and less bad news is to focus on the bad things and get more and more pessimistic, and get to the point where you don't want to have children because it's such a terrible world. And it's going to be such an awful world that we can't even think of bringing them into uh, into existence. Um, and I think it's very sad. In a funny way, you know, it reminds me of something I was thinking about the other day. When I was a kid in the late 70s, early 80s, and the Thatcherite project was going, those were difficult times. I remember some of the socialist worker type teachers in those days saying, not actually in my school, although I did have a socialist worker teacher as it happened. She, she was actually a very nice woman, very good German teacher. But in, in some schools, those socialist workers were going around saying there's no point in educating the kids for work. They'll never have work under this system. So why waste their time? Those kids who were in school, say, when I left in 83, the, the opportunities were then fantastic. In the 80s and 90s, unemployment started to come down and gradually from the early 90s, it became quite low. And there have been wonderful opportunities for people of my generation. And for some cynical, uninformed Trotskyist teacher back in the 80s to say, oh, these children will have such an awful time, there's no point in educating them. It's rather like people today saying, my kids are going to have such a miserable time, they shouldn't even be born. And in 20 years' time, I mean, of course, we may, the world may end in some nuclear or other catastrophe. I can't say it won't any more than my parents could say it wouldn't when I was born a few years after the Cuban Missile Crisis. I suspect that anyone today not having kids because their kids will have such a miserable life in 20 years' time, if they remember that decision and they look back in 20 years' time, they'll realize what a dumb decision it was. I think you're absolutely right on that. And I think it touches on something that I kept thinking about when I was reading your book. Uh, and I encourage everyone to read it. It's kind of fizzles the brain reading your book. It's, it's really, really fascinating. And it got me thinking about how we conceive of humanity more broadly. You're absolutely right that I think people who say today, well, I'm not having kids because the planet's going to hell in a handcart thanks to climate change. I think they will either regret it in 20 years' time when they realise actually humanity's still doing pretty well, as I expect it will be, or they're so hoodwinked by the climate change alarmist agenda that I think they probably will think they made the right decision, but they'll be wrong about that. It got me thinking about how we conceive of human beings. And this did remind me of uh, Julian Simon, who who you mentioned uh, as the kind of godfather of the more kind of positive approach to questions of demography, questions of growth, questions of population, the kind of anti-Paul Ehrlich in many ways. Paul Ehrlich was the kind of 
Malthus of the 70s who wrote some really horrible stuff, in fact. He's still going. I wish he should live to 120, but change his mind. Uh, you know, not only was he wrong about population growth, but the way he wrote about people in India and other countries was really uh, unpleasant, in my view. Really awful. Um, you know, the teeming crowds of people. It was terrible stuff. But in your book, which reminded me of more of Julian Simon's work, of course, you talk about human beings as the ultimate resource. And in order to deal with the demographic problems that you um, outline in the book, you say that we're going to need technological advances, we're going to need economic advances, we, we're going to need further breakthroughs, and we've had many over the past 200 years, the Industrial Revolution, the Green Revolution, the Nuclear Revolution, and so on. We're going to need more of those. And you make the point that those breakthroughs come from human beings. They come from having lots of minds, lots of hands, lots of contributors to the human project. And it made me think that today there is this tendency to see individual human beings as merely the users of resources and not also as the creator of resources. And I think th when that's the priority of a society, so we're all measuring our carbon footprint, how do we shrink our carbon footprint? How do we offset this amount of carbon we used? How do we offset something else? We're constantly checking how many resources we use. And there's very little celebration of how much resources people create. Don't we need a, a complete reset, I guess, in how we understand not only humanity more broadly, but the individual human being and what he or she is capable of in terms of improving life on the planet and not just draining from the planet? Well, I think you put it very eloquently yourself, and you don't need me to repeat it. We tend to think of whatever the past is in terms of the curve of progress. We then say, well, it will now flatten out, and then we'll have twice as many people and we'll be done for. There was a famous economist in 19th century Britain, I think he was in Cambridge, who wrote a book, and I think it was the 1880s, about coal. Now, of course, the whole Industrial Revolution depended on coal. And there's been a lot of work um, recently about how energy is absolutely everything. You know, it's not a nice to have. It's the core of everything. If we got out of the Malthusian trap, it was because of figuring out how to use coal for steam, et cetera, et cetera. Energy, energy is everything. And he said, we're running out of coal. We need to start conserving coal. Things are going to get very bad. We're going to go back to the way things were 100 years ago. And here we are. Now, I now remember in the 80s again, the very same sort of people who today tell us the world is coming to an end were telling us we needed to keep our coal mines open. And we're sitting under hundreds and hundreds of years of coal in this country. We will never mine. Not only because it's very carbon emitting, but also because it's incredibly labor intensive. It would make no economic sense, given oil and gas, but certainly renewable. And then they were in the 1880s, probably saying, oh, don't put another lump on the, on the fire, dear. We'll just go to bed a bit colder. Um, think about our grandchildren's prospects. And their great grandchildren couldn't give us stuff about their coal consumption. We need to say, was that unique to that moment in the 1880s? Or is it exactly the same now? I remember again in the 70s, I'm just about old enough to remember the 73 oil crisis, we were going to run out of oil. A point I like to make is think about oil at the moment, and it's not a terrible price. It's a manageable price. Venezuela has been completely mismanaged for decades. Iraq, Libya have no sensible opportunity for investment. They're total messes. Iran has sanctions. Russia has sanctions. And yet, we've got so much oil, we're not going to run out of oil. That old story, the Stone Age didn't end because they ran out of stone. We ain't going to run out of oil. That's clear now. If you look at the progress of renewables, and there we were in the 70s saying, oh, we're going to run out of oil. Uh, we'd better cut down, turn down the central heating, and so on. Um, of course, there are pinch points. There are times when there are supply uh, disruptions. Things happen like the rise of the OPEC cartel after the 73 Yom Kippur War or the Ukraine. Well, there are disruptions. There are setbacks. But if you look at the long arc, how it bends towards progress, material progress, and just go back to the 1880s and think about a Victorian equivalent of a a member of the Green Party or a Lib Dem, Victorian England, saying, um, probably a Quaker, saying, now, now, dear, you know, just put on your mittens and uh, don't burn another lump of coal. So I think if we can imagine that we're in a similar position and we actually look at the fantastic, just in the last 10, 15 years, the progress we've made in wind power, in solar power, in 
battery storage. Just look at the trajectory. That's not saying it's all going to be perfect tomorrow and there'll be more problems and we'll have to crack those. But can we get out of the idea that after making these extraordinary strides of human progress, we're now at the end of it? Paul, thank you very much. Thank you.